So again, Chair, uh, we do expect uh, Vice Chair Brooks and Alternate Commissioner uh, Donald Land to, to join us, but they will be uh, a little bit late. We do have a quorum, so once we hit nine o'clock, uh, you can start with whenever you'd like. Okay. Morning, everybody. Morning, Jim. Morning, Mr. Jim. Okay, it's 9 a.m. So um, I will call the meeting to order. I want to welcome everyone that is connected to this meeting. I see a few attendees. It's always nice to have interest. Um, and let's move to the first item on the agenda, the roll call. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. We'll start with Commissioner Jim Anderson. Here. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Here. Vice Chair Yvette Brooks is absent. Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Here. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Here. Commissioner Zach Friend. Here. Com uh, Chair Rochelle Lather. Present. Alternate Commissioner Ed Banks. Here. Alternate Commissioner John Hunt. Here. Alternate Commissioner Manu Koenig is absent. And Alternate Commissioner Donna Lynn is also absent. But Chair, we do have a quorum. OK, great. So um, we can move to the executive officer's message. Please summarize the virtual meeting protocol and any recent information, especially from the conference. You got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a reminder for the commissioners and members of the public, we are conducting this uh, virtual meeting using Zoom webinar uh, in accordance with AB 361. Uh, again, as a reminder, staff and the commissioners have complete control over your microphones and webcams. For members of the public, your webcams and microphones have been disabled. Uh, but you will be able to view and see the entire meeting. Uh, members of the public will also have the opportunity to address the commissioners on any agenda item. Uh, they'll have up to three minutes to address the commission on any agenda item. Staff will inform them when they have one minute left and when their time is up. Um, there's also uh, a requirement to do a roll call vote when the commission takes any action. Again, this is the same uh, protocol we've been using uh, during this last uh, year or so. And we'll go over uh, the future of virtual meeting uh, procedures uh, and a later agenda item. Uh, so Chair, that's my quick uh, update on the virtual meeting process. I also wanted to inform the commission that uh, our chair and I did attend Cal Lafco's annual conference, which was two weeks ago. It was after a three year hiatus uh, from the pandemic. And so it was great to see everyone. We had over 200 people in attendance at that conference, 47 out of the 58 LAFCOs, which is 81%. So we had a great uh, turnout. Uh, and just an FYI for the commission, staff was uh, the moderator and panelist for two sessions. Uh, those two sessions are currently the highest ranked in the survey by those attendees getting 4.5 out of five stars. I like to say that your staff is one of the reasons why uh, we got a higher rate, but you know, I'm the <laughs> highest. Uh, but it was a, it was a great turnout, and, and I'm glad we had uh, representatives from our commission there. Um, and chair, if you have any other comments, that that concludes my update on the executive officer's message. Yeah, the um, I I was very happy with the presentations. I thought yours was great, and then the other ones that I um, I attended, I learned quite a bit. So I appreciate that. Great. Okay, no action is required, so we can move to the next item. Correct. Um, adoption of minutes. Oh, did I miss something? Nope, you're, you're right. Adoption of the minutes is next. Okay. okay. So um, does anyone have any questions or edits to the minutes? I have to try to find my part where there's hands up or not. There, there's no hands raised from, from the commission or from the public on the adoption. Okay, so could, could I, um, oh, was I supposed to open this to the public? 
other comment? No. So this agenda item, if any member of the public wanted to uh, address the commission, they can. I do not see any hands raised. And typically okay. we don't. Uh, but, you know, this may be an opportunity for you to ask the commission if they want to uh, have a motion on approving the minutes. Yeah, I was going to move to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do I that. have a motion to approve the minutes? Also move. So there's a move motion by Jim Anderson. Second, Coonerty. Oh, okay. So you got a motion from Commissioner Jim Anderson and a second by Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Can you please take a roll call vote? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Jim Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson? Aye. Vice Chair Brooks is absent. Commissioner Ryan Crinity? Uh, aye. Commissioner Francisco Sada? Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend? Aye. And Chair Rochelle Leder? Aye. Chair, this motion passes unanimously. Okay, so we move on. So now we're at the um, as there are any member of the public that would like to speak on something that's not on the agenda? Chair, I do see a hand raised, so I'm going to ask them to unmute themselves. Oh, there's no face to it. Okay. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you all for your good work. I would like to... Um, just bring up a bit because I, I'm not sure it's on the agenda. I don't think it's on the agenda. And it's um, about the Brands of 40 fire and Scotts Valley fire um, merger. Um, I was, uh, I participated in the, the Brands of 40 fire board meeting. And um, I, I was disappointed, first of all, that the, the in person town hall meeting that was held to inform the Brands of 40 residents was not recorded. Um, I was not able to attend that, but at the meeting, there were people that referred to that. And um, I, think it, I think it's interesting that uh, the, the board did vote to go forward with partial assessment uh, survey, uh, engineer's report with SCI consultants just to determine uh, what the cost would be. They approved $28,000. So um, that that will be moving ahead. But I'm, I'm still curious to know how the AP Triton uh, consultants report will dovetail in and include that particular merger action. Um, I think I think it would have been good to have had that information to give to the Brands 40 community before they voted to spend $28,000 for a study. Um, and regarding the AP Triton, I am made aware that the um, County Fire Master Plan is moving forward, also employing AP Triton. So I think that it's- One minute less, Ms. Becky. Thank you. I, th I think that's very interesting. Um, <laughs> it was one other thing and it, it skated out. Um, it, it's regarding the water issues. Um, first of all, I do have um, a concern that Chair Lather did not ever recuse herself from any of the approvals of the SoCal Creek Water District portion of the countywide water service and sphere review. I, I think that she should have because she is on the board of that, that district. I also want to say that the um, water issues in the county, um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time this morning, that <laughs> um, the water issues in the county coming up with the um, master plan for the, the SB 552 compliance for the drought tolerant are talking about annexations and consolidations. And in that SB 552 drought response planning that the Board of Supervisors will be reviewing in December. 
Time is up. There is really no involvement of LAFCO in that, and I'm concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Madam Chair, I do not see any other requests to address the commission at this time. Is there anyone on the commission that wishes to speak on an item not on our agenda? I don't see anyone. And Chair, I will uh, kind of address uh, Ms. Becky's comments uh, just briefly. Uh, for the Brands of 40 Scotts Valley reorganization, uh, she's correct. The, the Brands of 40 board did hire SCI consultant to uh, conduct a benefit assessment study to determine how much it will cost to keep the fire station open with at least a two member crew. Uh, that that's something that if the Branson 40 community wants their fire station to remain open, they would need to fund it through a benefit assessment. And that's why they're, they hired SEI to do that study. AP Triton was hired by LAFCO to do a completely different study that will look at the current spheres from all the fire agencies and see what would be the financial impact if they would annex areas in their spheres. And how does that uh, affect CSA 48, which is um, a, a CSA that's operated by the county that provides fire protection to areas that are not in an independent fire district. So two completely different studies. Uh, they are involving fire agencies. Um, I just wanted to make that distinction. And in regards to the proposed conflict of interest with, when it comes to commissioners and, and actions on items, we'll discuss that in more detail uh, during uh, written correspondence. So that's later in the agenda. But again, uh, Chair, there are no other uh, requests to address the commission, and uh, this is a, no action is required on this item, so we can move forward if you'd like. Okay, so um, next are the public hearings. These items include, there's one item, and it's the countywide service and sphere review for county service areas. So, um, staff presentation. Great. Thank you. Was I was I cut out by my net? Uh, it was a little sporadic, but uh, we got the gist of it. You're requesting for a staff presentation. So I'll, I'll <laughs> okay, start. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the commission directed staff to develop this service and sphere review in accordance with the adopted multi-year work program to ensure that we fulfill the requirements under LAFCO law. Uh, this report analyzed the 34 road related county service areas in Santa Cruz County. Uh, CSAs are dependent special districts, which, unlike independent districts who have their own staff, board, and budget, uh, dependent special districts rely on the county, uh, in this case, for its operation and management. Uh, for purposes of today's presentation, I will focus on the five key findings in the report, but again, staff's comprehensive evaluation of each CSA is available in your agenda packet and on LAFCO's website. First, as I previously mentioned, the county governs the 34 CSAs. However, what LAFCO staff found interesting is that only two county public department employees are currently responsible for all the 34 CSAs. And a lot of the work is done by the residents. The CSAs are used more as a funding mechanism or better yet, uh, like a bank to collect and use the funds when needed. Uh, due to this type of structure, there is a huge void in transparency. Audits, budgets, maps, formation documents, meeting agendas or minutes, none of this information is available to the public. State law requires independent special districts to have all that information on their website and dependent special districts like CSAs should have that same standard. That is why LAFCO is requesting that the county develop a website or a web page dedicated to the CSAs. At minimum, the county should have LAFCO service review report available on their website as a resource, which has all that information already. The county has a year to complete this request. It is staff's understanding that the county is already working on this website or web page. And having uh, this information available like audits and budgets would allow the affected residents to see the, the CSA's financial health. And based on LAFCO's analysis, most of the CSAs have struggled or are struggling to cover annual expenses. 
only three out of the 34 CSAs did not experience a deficit during the last six fiscal years. Speaking of finances, half of the CSAs are funded by a flat rate paid by the affected residents within their respective CSA, while the other half pay based on the zones they live in within their CSA. So some CSAs have two zones, for example, developed versus undeveloped parcels, while others have up to 20 different zones. However, there are no maps or background information explaining the reasoning behind the zones. That is why LAFCO created maps depicting, depicting the different funding zones for each CSA. This is the first time this type of information is available for public view. LAF is, LAFCO is scheduled to work with the county to finalize these zone maps and make them available on the county's new CSA webpage. Uh, and finally, uh, we have the sphere boundaries. Just like cities and independent special districts, CSAs are required to have spheres to determine the agency's future service area. The majority of the sphere boundaries are coterminous with the CSA's service boundaries or jurisdictional boundaries. Staff has recommended that the spheres be reaffirmed with the exception of five CSAs, those being CSA 26, 28, 37, 39, and 42. CSA 39 has been inactive for years and should be dissolved, and the County Public Works Department agrees. Therefore, a zero sphere is being recommended by staff. The other four identified CSAs should be expanded to areas being served by the CSA, but outside their jurisdictional boundaries, and this would be a precursor to future annexations. Uh, so that would be staff's recommendation. Again, reaffirming most of the spheres, but with the exception of these five uh, before I uh, conclude my presentation, I do want to address the correspondence that we received from Ms. Becky Steinbrenner earlier this morning. Uh, her email was shared to the commission as well as uh, made available on LAFCO's website. Uh, just to summarize her comments, and, and Ms. Becky, if you're listening, you can also chime in once we open up uh, the floor for public comments. Uh, but it's staff's understanding that her comments focused on CSA 33 which she resides in. Uh, and it was mostly requesting verification that the information that we have, for example, uh, population, uh, uh, let me try that again, population estimates are accurate. So what staff will do is if the commission approves this report, we'll uh, look at our comments and verify that the information is accurate by uh, looking at, at our background information as well as confirming with County Public Works. So the, again, her, uh, comments are available on the LAFCO website and shared with the commission. Uh, I also spoke with our chair uh, earlier this morning about the report and she identified a couple of typos and grammatical errors, errors throughout the website. So again, as part of uh, the commission's approval of this report, staff will go through it one more time with a fine comb to ensure that any typos or grammatical errors uh, are addressed before the report is actually finalized. With that being said, staff is recommending that the commission find the countywide report to be, to be exempt from CEQA, determine that the countywide report fulfills the requirements under Government Code 56425 and 56430, and adopt the draft resolution approving the report with the identified conditions. Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, so. Um... After, let's see. So I'm opening this up to public comments. Are there any comments from the public? Yes, we do, Madam Chair. I do see one hand raised from Ms. Becky. So I'm going to ask her to unmute herself. Good morning again. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you very much. And I want to apologize for uh, sending my comments in at the 11th hour. I've um, been having some medical difficulties, so I apologize. Um, thank you, Director Serrano, for yet another amazing, very um, useful, comprehensive report. I really appreciate all of this work, and um, I think it's going to do have a, a better chance of really um, examining the issues within the county service area road maintenance groups 
and what needs to be done to address them. This has been an issue that many of us in these CSAs have been discussing amongst ourselves for a long time. For example, the transparency. We have people that buy property, move in, and have no idea what a CSA is or how to find out which in CSA 33 that does have these different um, uh, assessment areas. The, the more you use of the road, you mo the more you pay. So um, it, it's hard for people moving into the neighborhood to really understand that or to find out how to, f to get more information. So I really support um, the improvement to the Public Works website to provide that information. Our CSA cannot do that independently, and I think it's a great idea that you have to have Public Works manage that because they're already managing our, our accounts and our projects. As you say, the, the, the residents of the CSA really are the drivers in this, and I, that's the beauty of this system, in my opinion. We, we decide how much we're going to assess ourselves, and because we live here, we decide about the work. And we joke that Redwood Drive is in much better shape than Cathedral Drive, a county-maintained road as a result. But um, so to, to my point, and I won't repeat what is already in my, my comments, but I do support the website. I would want to know how much it's going to cost the people One more who would be paying to maintain it. I want to ask that you have a town hall meeting with all of the CSA liaisons and people and to involve the contractors. It has become very difficult to get a contractor to do, to bid on CSA work because of the difficulties with the county. Um, and we as CSA owner uh, people need to know how we would expand our CSA boundaries to include new properties that have decided to make their primary access to Redwood Drive. And finally, I could not find the appendix wherein I would see the um, formation papers for CSA 33. It has been an issue in our CSA that the CSA 33 monies cannot be used for the ancillary roads. And um, I got a question about that from a couple people Time wondering is up, where that is. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Are there any other comments from the public? Madam Chair, I do not see any other requests to address the commission at this time. Okay, I'm like trying to see it on my iPad. Um, okay, so I will close the public comment period and I will um, ask the commissioners if they have any comments. I do see one hand raised from uh, Commissioner Hunt. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one question. Um, so in dissolving CSA 39, that leaves about 370 feet of roadway that it would, will that be taken over by County Public Works for maintenance? How does that work when a CSA gets dissolved? So great, great question. And the, the county hasn't been doing any road maintenance work on that. Um, and I'm not sure if, there, if this if this area for CSA 39 is considered private road or not. Uh, I know we have um, someone from Public Works, but in essence, uh, the successor agency in this case would be the county uh, in the event that any uh, road maintenance would be required uh, in that area. So CSA 39 would be dissolved and if there's any road improvements, it would be uh, the county because they will, they will be defaulted as a successor agency. Thank you. And Madam Chair, we do have another request from uh, Commissioner Roger Anderson. Commissioner Anderson. Okay, I guess I'm on. I can't get my <laughs> camera to work this morning. We can hear you. Any, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, um, I can't get my camera to work this morning, but I don't think it's that important. The, um, I, first of all, I believe that the report that Ms. Serrano has put together satisfies all of the requirements of our MSRs. I have a few little technical things, though, to start with. Um, the first one is that I checked particularly the, the ones where you wanted to change the spheres. And the one that I could not find, 
I couldn't understand exactly what the sphere change was for CSA 28. Uh, so that one is a, uh, I, I can't, the maps are, uh, there's no indication of what the existing sphere is versus the new one. And I'd just like to have that taken a look at. Okay. The, um, the other thing is sort of related to what Becky Steinbrenner was talking about is the question of population and expenditures for the various CSAs. And I would like to see the total expenditures and the total population added to the relevant tables in the text and the uh, executive summary. Okay. Uh, they kind of end now just a long list and there are too many numbers for me to just add up easily. So I thought that you should provide those. The, um, so there are those, those general questions about the report. Um, I think it's a useful report. However, as I'll spend a little bit of time talking about now, there's things that still are missing that we'd like to understand. And the first one of those is the um, whether what's the relationship of this report and the CSAs with fire safety within the uh, um, within the county. Now, I don't believe that we have to worry about fire safety on this particular report. But it's something that I would like to see some, what is the connection between this and the, the overall uh, question about access and quality of roads for providing fire service. Now, somewhat related question is the general question about how monies are expended in this, in this set of CSAs. Uh, it's pretty clear that we have a bad storm or there's a fire or earthquake or some other event which can destroy roads. The costs for maintenance of the roads may be great, much greater than we have right now. And so I, I'm just curious what kind of mechanism there is to sort of balance that out um, to be able to, um, let's say, include the, the availability of grants and various things like that. Again, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be done for this report, but I think it's an issue that we should be looking at. Um, the other question, of course, is governance. Now, if I were on the board of supervisors and sitting here with 34 of these CSAs, um, I, I don't think I'd have very much time to, to deal with those issues. And so I'm kind of curious exactly how the county handles its management of the CSAs. Now, this, I think, is a LAFCO issue. And we probably, again, in some later work, addressed it as well. The um, population issues, I think that um, Ms. Steinbrenner is absolutely right. The number for CSA 33 is probably low that's in the report. And one thing that I would like you to do is to look at the comparison of the number of what the population number of parcels. And there are a few of them where there are uh, many more parcels than there are people. Now I can understand that a little bit, but I don't quite understand why those people would be interested in contributing to the road maintenance if there are you know, not that many there. So anyway, that, that's something that should be cleaned up. And I don't know what your source of data is necessarily, Mr. Toronto, but it should it would be nice to get some of that straightened out. All right. Um, so the, um, the other question comes up is, is there any opportunity for consolidation? But looking at the maps, um, they look like they're everywhere scattered around the county. So that's maybe not possible to do. So anyway, those are my comments. There are a few of them that have to be made for the report and the others are for future work. Thank you, Commissioner Roger Anderson. And Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to address uh, uh, Commissioner Roger Anderson's comments and, and concerns. And for one, uh, regarding CSA 48, uh, CSA 28, the spheres, actually the, the, the five that I identified uh, or the four that I identified that needed a sphere expansion, it's simply to address split parcels so each, for example, CSA 28 has a parcel, half of it is in uh, the district, uh, the other half is not. Uh, and I, I apologize that it's not clear in the map, but it's simply to address a split parcel. And that's for the other uh, proposed sphere ex expansions. It's to simply include the entirety of that parcel. And that's what uh, staff found when doing our analysis on the sphere boundaries. So that's, that's what's happening for CSA 28. In regards to population estimates, that's one thing that LAFCO has seen in the last couple of years that I've been doing these reports for Santa Cruz LAFCO is that there are no population projections 
uh, or population data for special districts, uh, especially for CSAs. And so what LAFCO attempts to do is to provide some type of estimates uh, for these reports. And what LAFCO does is we coordinate with uh, counties, uh, a mapping department, uh, as well as our GIS, GIS capabilities to uh, use ArcGIS uh, population data to, to kind of get a, a, an estimate of what the uh, population would be within these CSAs. It's not exact, but at least it gives us a, a talking point. And what LAFCO staff can do is coordinate with the county and with the, uh, the community uh, representatives to, to perfect that data. Uh, that's something that we could do as part of the, this report is uh, review the uh, LAFCO's findings with the county and the uh, community representatives. And if we could perfect the data points, as, for example, population projections, uh, we'll definitely update. This report is meant to, to be a resource. And if we can improve upon it uh, and we can get better data, we'll definitely use it. So again, this was just LAFCO staff's attempt to provide information when it comes to population projections, understanding that you know it's not precise, it's not uh, uh, the exact count, uh, but it gives us a talking point. Uh, when it comes to the fire safety connection to the county roads, I think that's a great idea. That's something that LAFCO staff will look into when we look at county roads again, which, uh, for example, CSA 9, uh, I think that's a, a valid point, and LAFCO will look into it in future reports. Uh, another discussion about governance and just the mechanism, uh, it's LAFCO staff's understanding that the county for these CSAs are more reactive. So it's until the residents say, hey, we have an issue with our road, that's when the county uh, provides assistance. So that, that's based on LAFCO's kind of analysis on how the, the governance and operations for these CSAs is currently being operated. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the conditions in the resolution is for LAFCO to meet with the county and the community representatives to discuss the report uh, and find ways to, to improve transparency and communication. I think LAFCO uh, can play a role in being facilitator in those discussions and make sure that you know the CSAs are running op, uh, efficiently uh, and, and there's more awareness and more transparency. So that's something that LAFCO staff is, is gonna be working on within uh, this next uh, couple months. And as far as consolidations, one of the staff's initial idea was, if we would reset today, would we have 34 county road CSAs? Uh, I think the answer is no, but it, we can't just consolidate all 34. Uh, but that kind of discussion, I, I like to have with the county to see if there's any other ways internally to improve how these CSAs are, are currently being operated. So those are, again, uh, Commissioner Roger Anderson, great points. And, and I agree with those points. And we're gonna continue working with the county and the residents to, to improve the, the way these CSAs are currently being operated. So can I, do my comments now? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, as far as population goes, I mean, I've looked at every single one and there were a lot of them that said eight. And then they'd have like 20, 30, 100 parcels. So you know, that's not the best guess. I think that, um, you, you know, you really need to look at it. I mean, what I do is I look at how many houses there are and I multiply it times 2.3. Okay. And, you know, at least it's close to the average. I With the housing shortage, I doubt that they're empty, but I was thinking maybe some of them were um, vacation homes. I don't know. Okay. Um, the, 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 I guess the bottom line for me is what is the purpose of each of these CSAs? It's not clear what they're supposed to be spending money on. If it says lights, are they replacing lights every year? Or are they waiting for the CSA members to tell them they need their lights replaced? I don't think waiting for them to tell you is a really great way to do it. Um, but, you know, I know Ms. Steinbrunner said that, you know, they tell the county what to do. But the thing is, is when you do that, you're waiting until it's an emergency and then suddenly everybody's supposed to pitch in a thousand dollars because there's not enough money to do whatever it is they want. Um, over time, it would be better to have like a plan. And instead of waiting until there's a reaction, there's, you know, FEMA money. FEMA is not going to always bail everybody out. If they see that you're not even trying to make it better, um, they're not going to be doing it forever. Um, 
the other thing um, is in this county, there's a lot of private roads you'd think are public roads. And this is how they, you know, this is a crazy system. I don't know how to change it. I'm just suggesting this to the Board of Supervisors members that, that that's something that needs to be looked at. It's been like this for a hundred years, but that doesn't mean it's right. And that's why these CSAs are all over the place is because for whatever reason, they were determined to be private roads. And there's probably some that don't even have a CSA and people are wondering why there's so many potholes and it's because they're not public. Um, the last thing is, um, yeah, I wasn't sure what actually is being done. I looked at each of them and their um, budgets and what they did, every, how much they spent every year. And it seems like most of them, they spent money when there was a road slip out and need to be repaired and they had FEMA money. And um, some of them, they spent 30,000, but it wasn't clear what it was on. So I figure it's like painting um, asphalt on the top of the road to make it look good because that's not very much money. Um, and then when you say there's two full-time employees, are they working full-time on these CSAs? Because I don't think that enough money is being spent if they are. And these are things that should be looked into. Great, yeah, great point. Uh, uh, and, and again, that's something that LAFCO staff is encouraging the county to provide more information uh, on their website so it's available. Uh, as far as the, the county public works employees that are assigned to these CSAs, um, I'm sure they, they are they're stretched thin in the sense that they, they are assigned to these 34 CSAs, but they're also working on other, other um, tasks and projects. So uh, I, I don't think that they're full time, just these uh, 34 CSAs. But again, um, I'll get clarification from the county, but it, it is a limited. You have, 34, you have 34 CSAs and only two public uh, employees assigned to them. Um, and it raises the question of you know, how much work can it can it be done? And I think that's the reason why they're they're really relying on the residents to tell them uh, when services are needed. Uh, but there's always well, the, always areas of improvement. It looks to me like the amount of money that's being spent is just for them to do their budgets every year. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, yeah, valid point. Yeah, valid point. So anyway, those are my comments. I don't know what we can actually do about it, but I think it's not clear. I mean, you, you did a review of these CSAs and it's really not clear what the purpose of the CSA is and that would be nice to have. Because how do you decide to dissolve it if you don't even know what the purpose is? And again, that's why staff wants to meet with, with the representatives and with the county uh, so that it, it is clear. Uh, not just to 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 our commission, but, but for the public. Uh, what what's their purpose? What services they're providing? Uh, and, and you know what's their boundaries? All that information. It, it shouldn't be hard uh, to explain that. It should be available, just like a water district. They can make it clear that they're providing potable, non-potable irrigation. It it should be the same standard for CSAs. Yeah, and I'm a little disappointed to see that no one from that I can tell from Public Works is on the line. Is there someone there? Yeah, we do have a representative from County Public Works uh, and she okay. has her hand raised, Ms. Sonia Likens. You've been asked to be unmuted. Ms. Sonia? Uh-oh. <laughs> it shows that you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Are you muted on your end, maybe? I see her clicking mute and unmute, but I don't hear anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Sonia. <laughs> but to answer your question, uh, Chair, there is, she is here representing County Public Works. Okay. I wonder if she could, that's not her on my phone. Yeah, Ms. Sonia, unfortunately, we, we, we don't hear you. Well, uh, Madam Chair. Um, okay, I guess 
is there any other, are there any other comments from other members of the commission? Welcome Yvette. Is there a motion? So moved. Coonerty. So we have a motion from Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. I will, I will second. And a second by Roger Anderson, Commissioner Roger Anderson. Madam Chair, would you like me to do a roll call vote? Oh, yes, please. All right. <laughs> Caught me sleeping here. No, no problem. Commissioner Jim Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson? Aye. Vice Chair Yvette Brooks? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan Crinity? Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada? Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend? Aye. And Chair Rochelle Lather? Aye. Chair, this motion passes unanimously. Okay, so now we move on to other business, the virtual meeting update. Will you please provide your presentation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Now that the governor plans to lift the state of emergency in February, AB 361 uh, will no longer be uh, serviceable. However, a new law, AB 2449, will go into effect on January 1st which will allow local agencies to use virtual meetings under specific conditions. After speaking with our legal counsel, staff believes that the conditions under AB 2449 are very specific and it makes it difficult to implement a hybrid model. For example, an in-person quorum uh, must be always in place and commissioners, commissioners can only attend remotely if they can be seen and heard and have a valid excuse to attend virtually. Uh, simply wanting to attend remotely is not good enough. <laughs> it, it needs to be an emergency, an illness, or a work-related reason to consider attending virtually. Uh, because of this, staff is recommended that the commission revert, revert back to in-person meetings starting in March. Our next regular scheduled meeting will be on January 4th, and that will be our last virtual meeting under AB 361. Uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, so I'm opening public comments. Do we have any? We do. Uh, Ms. Becky, you've been asked to be unmuted. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I, I support <laughs> getting the in-person meetings back. What I wonder is if the remote option will still be available for members of the public to participate. There are some people who actually prefer to do that versus in person. So would the public still be able to participate in a hybrid format, both in person and virtual? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Becky. Madam Chair, I do not see any other requests to address the commission at this time. Okay, so um, I will close the public comment period and um, come to the, the commission. Are there any commissioners that want to say anything? Roger Anderson? Yeah, just a quick thing. I. I'm hopeful that the COVID situation is, will be declining, but I'm worried about a surge in November, December, January. And I don't know how long that might last for, but there are new variants. People have really relaxed their guard in a large degree within the county. And I am a whole state and country probably. But anyway, I'm, I would like to at least have a short discussion of this again at our next meeting, which is in January, um, just to make sure that nothing has changed. So in other words, um, I'm willing to go ahead and vote to do start these meetings um, in March, but at the same time, I, I think we should be a little bit cautious about them. And my question is, do we have an option 
at that point. Mr. Strano, would you like me to address that? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson, it's a it's a very good point you make. Um, you know, the 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 uh, staff's recommendation is based um, in part on the governor's um, indication that he will be rescinding the state of emergency effective uh, March 1st. Um, if we do get another surge or the, you know, health um, indicators change and, and that changes at the governor levels, uh, then then that definitely could change our 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 availability. Um, you know, to meet under AB 361 and the, the flexible procedures we're using currently, um, it does require that that state of emergency be in effect. So if that, you know, if 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 COVID does get worse and and the governor leaves that in place, the commission would have the ability to continue to meet remotely. Um, by contrast, if if the anticipation holds and the state of emergency goes away at the end of February, uh, then we would wouldn't be able to use AB 361, and our choices would be to meet in person or to use um, AB 2449, which, as Mr. Serrano mentioned, is is impractical. That being said, uh, Josh, and correct me if I'm wrong, if we, it's a great idea, Commissioner Roger Anderson, to bring this back in January, and that's something that staff was going to do, is, is bring this back uh, in preparation to reverting back to in-person meetings. But if there is a surge and there isn't a state of emergency, we can use uh, the criteria under AB uh, 2449. It, it's just, a, it's more robust. Uh, there needs to be clear co uh, coordination with the commissioners, but we could do uh, a, a hybrid model. Um, but again, under AB 2449, we still need to have a quorum uh, in person. So those commissioners that are are, are feeling sick uh, can, can attend virtually. So again, we, we need to have a, a new procedure. And that's something that uh, staff will bring to the commission uh, in January. That way we have steps to take if there's a surge uh, with or without a state of emergency. That way the commissioners and staff have guidelines on what to do. Okay, um, does anybody else have a wish to speak or any questions? Doesn't look like it. So um, we can move to the, um, is there a motion in the second? I'll move the recommended actions at SAC. Thank I'll you, second Zach. It, Jim. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Will you please take the roll call? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Jim Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson? Aye. Vice Chair Yvette Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Ryan Crinity? Aye. Commissioner Francisco Sada? Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend? Aye. And Chair Rochelle Leander. Aye. So that's unanimous vote. We'll move on to the next item, which is the multi year work program update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just simply uh, put, this uh, is just a, an information for the Commission to see. Uh, what projects are coming up for the coming year, specifically the service reviews, uh, in accordance with the adopted work program that the commission approved back in 2019. We are scheduled to have six service reviews to be presented to the commission in the 2023 uh, calendar year. Uh, we will start off the year in May and June with service reviews for the city of Watsonville and, and the city of Santa Cruz. We'll then look at CSAs specifically CSA 11 in August, CSA 12 in September, CSA 38 in, uh, in October, and finally CSA 53 in November. Uh, Chair, this is an informational item. Again, this was just to, to show the commission what projects and service reviews were gonna be completed uh, in the upcoming calendar year. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, so I will open this item for public comments. Are there any comments? Madam Chair, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay, um, then I'll bring it back to the commission. Um, do any commissioners have any comments or wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, this is an informational item so we can just move on to the next item. 
Madam Chair, I, I apologize. This uh, does have a recommendation by staff to approve the scheduled service reviews for uh, the 2023 calendar year. So I apologize for. Uh, he gave me bad instructions. I man. gave you bad directions. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, so I need a motion to um, accept this item. I'll make the motion to accept this item. I'll, I'll second. second. So we got a motion by Commissioner Jim Anderson and a second by Vice Chair Yvette Brooks. So please take the roll call. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Jim Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson? Aye. Vice Chair Yvette Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Ryan Crunity? Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada? Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend? Aye. And Chair Rochelle Lather? Aye. Chair, this uh, motion passes unanimously, and that's the last one that requires commission action. So I, I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so now we're um, at written correspondence. Um, please provide a um, summary of. Yeah, so this is a, just a, an annual um, action by the commission to approve the meeting calendar for the, uh, the 2023 calendar year. So again, I apologize. This also requires action by the commission. Uh, and that's just to simply approve. Uh, oh, sorry. I was looking at the wrong one, wasn't I? Sorry about that. No, no, no. It, it, it's fine. The so meeting schedule. This is the meeting schedule. And, and again, uh, this just shows uh, the upcoming meeting dates for the 2023 calendar year. Typically, we have July dark as well as December, but staff is also recommending that the February meeting be canceled, and that is because my wife is expected to give birth in early February, maybe late January. And as much as I love LAFCO, there's nowhere else that I'd rather be than by my wife's <laughs> side as we give birth to our first child. <laughs> Uh, so as you can see in the picture, uh, we just had a Halloween themed baby shower. Uh, so staff is recommending that the commission approve the 2023 calendar year uh, with having February, July, and December uh, dark days so we don't have a commission meeting uh, on those months. And Chair, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions once you open and close. Hope comments. Only question I have is, um, does the baby get to sign this? Because they're the ones that decide what the date is. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. so um, I am opening this for public comment. Is there anyone from the public that's interested in speaking on this item? Madam Chair, I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay, so I will bring it back to the commission. Are there any commissioners that want to say anything in addition to what I already said? Seeing none, um, can you please take, oh, I'm sorry. I need yeah, just, a motion and a second on this. I'll make the motion to approve the meeting schedule for 2023. I'll second. Okay, we have double Andersons there. All right. Uh, we got and, a from Jim Anderson, a second from Roger Anderson, and I'll conduct a roll call vote. So Commissioner Jim Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson? Aye. Vice Chair Yvette Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Ryan Crinity? Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada? Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend? Aye. And Chair Rochelle Lather? Aye. This motion passes unanimously. So the next item is the comprehensive quarterly report for the first quarter. And just briefly, Madam Chair, uh, this report uh, summarizes the projects and tasks completed during the first quarter of fiscal year 22-23. Uh, the only thing I want to highlight is that LAFCO staff has already uh, received over 100% of our anticipated revenue. Uh, and during this quarter, we have uh, incurred 20% of our anticipated expenses. Uh, typically, uh, during this part of the year, we want to be at least 25% or below. So we're, we're exactly where we want to be at, at this point. And Madam Chair, this is an informational item. No commission in action is required, but I'd be happy to answer any questions once you close it, once you open and close public comments. 
Okay, so I will open public comments if there's anyone that has anything to share or uh, discuss about the quarterly report. And Madam Chair, we do have requests from Ms. Becky Steinbrenner. So Ms. Becky, you've been asked to be unmuted. Okay, thank you. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I've got a lot of static on my line here with the rain. <laughs> um, thank you again, Mr. Serrano, for your good work. I have reviewed all of the meetings that you went to in July, August, and September, and I really want to thank you for, for going that extra mile and um, being present at these meetings. I um, have felt sometimes when you, you are online and available at um, some commission meetings that they really should consult with you more than they, they tend to do. But I, I know that you are there and I see all this list of, of things uh, that you are doing above and beyond your, your regular work on top of all of these amazing uh, services fear reports that you're doing. So I wanna thank you. I'm especially glad that you're meeting with the Renaissance High School folks because they have been really troubled with the water quality issue at their school um, to, the, to the detriment and health problems of, of the kids and staff there. So thank you so much for, for working with them on that. And again, thank you for your good work. Thank you, Ms. Becky, I really appreciate that. Madam Chair, I do not see any other hand raised at this time. Sorry about that, I muted myself. Um, okay, um, so I will close public comment and um, bring it to the commission. Are there any commissioners that wish to speak on this item? Are there any, Joe? No, ma'am, I'm sorry, uh, there's no, uh hand raised or indications that the commission wants to uh, discuss this item. Okay, and there's no um, there's no motion required, so let's move on to written correspondence. Perfect. Somehow I wanted to go there first. <laughs> uh, well, just I just want to briefly summarize, we did get a, a number of written correspondence submitted in October. Uh, we did get uh, the commission received an award from SDRMA uh, for the fact that we haven't done any workers' comp in the last five years. So congratulations on earning this award. I didn't know that it existed, but hey, check you out. You got a President's Special Acknowledgement Award. Uh, you also, Your staff also received a Certificate of Achievement for completing Focus Ag. This is something that the Commission approved back in 2019-2020 for staff to complete. It only took me two years to graduate, but I, I finally did it. Uh, this just shows uh, an acknowledgement and, and Supervisor Monica Koenig, who's our commissioner, was also part of that class. Um, I also got uh, an uh, email from CalAFCO indicating that the state controller's office has published their latest list of inactive special districts. Uh, as you may recall, uh, two years ago, uh, a new law was implemented that requires the state controller's office to identify inactive special districts. If a district is identified in this list, the uh, responsible LAFCO has to mandatorily dissolve uh, the identified district. In this case, we have one, which is CSA 54. The commission uh, may recall that we recently did a service review involving CSA 54 earlier this year, and we anticipated that this was going to happen, and uh, staff's findings were correct. The state controller's office has identified CSA 54 uh, as an inact inactive district. The commission adopted a zero sphere earlier this year, and once we officially get a letter from the state controller's office sometime in the next week or so, uh, we will process the mandatory dissolution and we'll probably present it to the commission in January. And finally, uh, we did get uh, an email from Ms. Becky Steinbrenner uh, questioning uh, if there is a conflict of interest uh, for one of our commissioners and our legal counsel involving Soco Creek Water and LAFCO actions. Uh, I, I will defer to our legal counsel, but I will note that under LAFCO law, 
if you are appointed to uh, the commission, uh, yes, your peers selected you to represent uh, the special district seat or the county seat or the city seat. Uh, but when you're on the commission uh, board, uh, you are uh, a LAFCO commissioner. You take off your agency's hat and you put on your LAFCO hat, for lack of better terms. Uh, and so you have the option to recuse yourself on any items if there's any financial contributions. Uh, but you, you are uh, responsible for taking action as a commissioner. Uh, but again, I want to defer to our legal counsel because he'll give the more uh, professional response to that, but uh, I'll defer to you, Mr. Joss, if you want to clarify my comments. Yeah, no, I'm not sure, Joe. I think you covered it. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, the the question is whether a, uh, you know, commissioner has a has a conflict of interest when they consider an item that comes before LAFCA that affects their appointing agency. Um, and the short answer is no. Um, and as Joe mentioned, LAFCA law is actually explicit on that and, and explicitly says that it is not a conflict of interest um, for commissioners to make decisions on items that affect their their appointing agency. Um, you know, related to uh, uh, to, to mine and uh, uh, you know to me, um, I am you know general counsel for SoCal Creek Water District, um, and you know when we were hired, um, Joe um, and the commission approved hiring um, conflict counsel that's available. So if there was an item uh, that affected the district that required substantive legal review, um, you know Mr. Serrano would be able to call upon that that conflicts counsel, and I wouldn't participate in that matter. I'm happy to answer any questions or Joe, if you wanted to add anything. No, you're you're absolutely right. When when this commission hired uh, as Best and Krieger as our general counsel, the commission also hired uh, Colin Tuno, Highsmith, and Watley as our special counsel in the event that there is a conference with BBK. And so we have a retainer with them. So again, as uh, Josh mentioned, if there is a conflict with BBK on any particular item, we do have our special counsel on standby. So this is, again, this is uh, another example of the commission being proactive uh, in the event that some uh, certain circumstances like that uh, come in, in, in the future. And so we're prepared for that. Uh, Chair, this is an informational item. No commission action is required, but I'd be happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, I just wanna make sure I wasn't muted. Um, I am opening the floor for public comments. Are there any uh, members of the public that wish to speak on this item? And there, there is one request from Ms. Becky. Ms. Becky, you've been asked to be unmuted. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Director Serrano, I appreciate you bringing this um, discussion to the commission. And also, I appreciate Council Nelson's legal interpretation of it. However, there is always the public's perception that um, any govern, governing body needs to be mindful of, even though it is not legally required that uh, a commissioner recuse themselves for the benefit of the public's trust and the appearance of any possible um, prejudice, I, I really do want commissioners and your legal counsel to consider this, even if by law it were not required that you would do so to impart a sense of um, paying attention to how it looks to the public, for lack of a better word. Because I attend the SoCal Creek Water District board meetings, I, I heard their, that board's discussion about this, and there is resistance um, to any annexation in the area of the Renaissance High School. They voted it down. And it, it bothers me as a member of the public to hear that um, a commissioner is, is is taking action on the, the annexation process itself, knowing that the board that that person represents very strongly is against it. Now, I, I understand that, that it is a, a body of, of commissioners that makes the vote, but the public appearances and the public trust is important. So I would like to ask that in the future, any commissioners who have oh, any man. thought 
that there could be an appearance of um, lack of impartiality that you just automatically recuse yourself for the public benefit. And I would like to ask that Ms. Mr. Um, Nelson also do the same when any water issues come before this, this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Becky. Madam Chair, I do not see any other hands raised at this time. Okay, and um, are there any commissioners that wish to speak on this item? I've closed public comments. Madam Chair, I don't see any hand raised or indications by the commissioners. Okay, so let's move on to press articles. Madam Chair, uh, again, this is just a, a regular agenda item uh, identifying articles that may be of interest to the commissioners. Um, but I don't have any staff presentations, but I'd be happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, so I will open public comments. Is, is there a member of the public that has some press article they wanted to discuss on this item? Madam Chair, I don't see any hand raised at this time. Okay, so I'll close that. Are there any commissioners? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, this, this is Zach. I'd just like to briefly acknowledge um, our outgoing County Supervisor, Ryan Coonerty. I believe this is his last LAFCO meeting before he uh, departs into his post-supervisorial world. So I just wanted to acknowledge him for oh. he's taken a pretty significant leadership role at LAFCO over the course of time, as had his father. So. Um, I know that we generally have an acknowledgement, Joe, of, of members, but I mean, I think enticing Ryan back in all likelihood after he's a LAFCO member to be acknowledged is, is about less than a zero chance. So <laughs> I wanted to just take the uh, opportunity now to, to say I appreciated his work um, in regards to some of the, the sticky San, Santa Cruz issues in particular and some of the land use issues and his leadership in LAFCO and those issues. Thank you, Zach. Um... Are there any other commissioners? Yeah, we can, we can move to uh, commissioner business in case uh, that discussion wants to continue. Okay, so let's move to commissioner's business. Are there yeah. any commissioners that have anything they'd like to share specifically, uh, Mr. Coonerty? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, at, at our January meeting, we when we present, uh, the draft resolution appreciation to Commissioner Ryan Coonerty that he can join us at least virtually for a, a few minutes because uh, Commissioner Zach Friend is absolutely right. His, his dedicated service should be acknowledged, and then that was on on staff's uh, to do list for January. But you, you you raise a good point, Mr. Zach. Of you know, I had to uh, find a way to get Ryan to attend that meeting at least virtually for a little bit. I don't see Ryan on the list right now. Did he sign out? I believe he had a he had a leave. He had a, another uh, meeting at ten. Okay. So, um, yes, you're going to have to try to make him come. <laughs> I'll do my best, but yeah, I, that's something that uh, staff wanted to present um, at the January meeting. Should have done it in November, but time is flying by. Yeah. Okay, so um, is there any other? Madam Chair, I don't see any hands raised for commissioner business item, uh, and I don't see any other requests or comments from the commission. Okay, so um, I will adjourn the meeting until January 4th at 9 a.m. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.